Welcome to the forum, the City Club of Eugene's July 8th, 2016 program, Where the Jobs Are. Today's pro program will discuss the local and regional economic sectors that have remained robust through the ups and downs of markets and those that are emerging due to creative forces. I'm James Baldock, former City Club president, filling in for the current City Club president, Juan Carlos Valle, who is away. City Club of Eugene is a nonprofit funded with the support of members and sponsors. Our mission is to build community vision through open inquiry. We do this by exploring a wide range of significant local, state, and national issues and helping to formulate new approaches and solutions to pro pro ugh, problems. <laughs> Haven't been doing this for long enough. We host nearly 50 original nonpartisan programs every year. Membership is open to all, and we welcome anyone who wants to make Eugene and our region a better place to live, work, and play. If you believe that civic engagement is the lifeblood of democracy, join us, become a member at cityclubofeugene.org. Today's program is sponsored by Louvis Cobb. Established in 1955, Louvis Cobb is one of the oldest and most respected law firms in Oregon. Marilyn Milne, Public Relations Services. Whether it's media relations, social media, community relations, or counsel, Marilyn will provide the guidance and actions that help you achieve your goals. And the Collegian, private student living built for academic success in Eugene, Oregon. And finally, KPFF Consulting Engineers, partnering with the world's most thoughtful professionals to engineer extraordinary places. Special thanks go to KPFF Consulting Engineers for supplying our office space. Thank you to Community Television of Lane County for televising recent City Club programs Monday through Saturday at noon and Sunday at 9 p.m. And thanks to KLCC Radio for airing these programs at 6.30 on Monday nights and for archiving the podcast on their website. And now, Where the Jobs Are, our 36th forum in our 2015-2016 programming year, Mary Layton coordinated today's program and she'll be introducing the speakers. As new graduates stride out in the workforce, what opportunities might they see right here in Lane County? Or when career wanderlust besets older adults, where might they look for new places to invest their skills without having to move away? In this program, we will learn about the economic sectors that have remained robust through the ups and downs of the markets and those that are emerging. Um, I'm going to introduce you to three women with whom I've worked as part of the course that we offered together with Lane Workforce Partnership and Lane ESD uh, for teachers in the, in the community. Uh, so these three people are full of information. Uh, so get the millennials out of your basements uh, um, and encourage workforce participation by people who got discouraged. There are jobs out there, and they're really an interesting and amazing array of jobs. Kim Thompson, uh, her main priority in the Oregon Department, uh, or Employment Department is tracking workforce activity. Uh, she's been a major developer of the State of the Workforce Report for several years. She has a million numbers, almost all of them interesting and hopeful, and she will share a few of them with you. Jennifer Adams will explain what bulk handling systems does and sketch the array of positions in its work. BHS is only one of four companies in the United States that does what it does. Uh, and I, I just like, it's a stopper. It's a, every time I go out and tell people about bulk handling, I'll get a party and a random conversation, they're amazed. Because um, like, if you don't do this kind of thing, it's hard to even imagine it's out there in the world. Uh, and finally, Becky DeWitt, closer to home, we'll talk about the broad spectrum of jobs that keeps our city uh, operational. And they range from things that a high school graduate could do uh, to much more technical, and in some cases, special jobs invented for people of particular skill. Uh, lots and lots of work in the city keep, to keep us going. And Becky will talk a little bit about what that spectrum of work involves. But let's start with Kim, who'll give us the big picture. Okay, hello everyone. Please raise your hand if my voice gets too fast or too low. Uh, so I work for the employment department and we do track employment trends and we do 10-year employment projections. We are now in a brand new cycle of 10-year projections for 2014 to 2024. Unfortunately, they're not as updated as we like because it takes some time to get 15 economists in a room to talk about it. But it's, it doesn't change quick enough that it's not relevant still. So 
Uh, Lane County is really diverse when we talk about the kinds of things we do here. We track 13 different industries and we, we make it look like a pie and we say if Lane County was a pie, how big would the industry pieces be? And uh, maybe not a surprise to any of you that government is a very large piece of our pie. We have city government, state government, local government, county government, we have school districts, 16 school districts in Lane County, and we have a major university that's state funded so and a very large community college that's state funded so all of that goes into one piece of pie called government so that is about 20 to 22 percent of our uh, industry makeup here in Lane County so having the city here is really something that we need to be looking at in terms of uh, employment in our community uh, we have a very large manufacturing sector. That's why Jennifer's here, because it's uh, really important a part of our economy. A lot of people think wood products is dead around here, but that's just not true. 3,200 people work in this uh, industry in Lane County alone. That's a lot of people, and the wages are sometimes really high for people just getting out of high school. They can be $50,000 in some industries just right out of high school if you're willing to do something uh, gra graveyard shift, any job. That's what employers tell me. Um, I think even one employer told me that if uh, somebody was willing to do any shift, any job in his mill, they could make six figures in their 20s. So it's not dead. It is viable. And it is something that a high school graduate who wants to work with their hands could go right into. We have a lot of machinery manufacturing, heavy equipment, um, fabricated metals, big pieces of metal, which Jennifer can get into. So we do a lot of different manufacturing here that maybe we didn't do in the 80s. So we've diversified our manufacturing from all timber to maybe a secondary wood product or metal. Uh, we, might, we made RVs really well here for a while. That's coming back. That's uh, something in the forecast that's different for us than the state. We're projecting our RV and um, equipment manufacturing to go up 40% in 10 years. And that's because of uh, kind of the resurgence of making trailers here, not just RVs, but trailers, toy haulers. Um, we've got Camping World that came in, and now we've got uh, Winnebago coming back. So we're still doing pretty well in that industry and is probably the largest change that I see in any small industry going into the next 10 years. Um, let's see what else we do. Um, if I had to talk about the two things that are probably pretty stable going in and have been since the recession even, it would be healthcare. We have the second largest healthcare uh, group in the state of Oregon outside of Portland, obviously. We have some major hospitals three to four, if you're counting Florence, major hospitals in Lane County that um, with clinics and other things employ over 20,000 people in Lane County. So very large, very stable, always on the upswing. We, even during the recession, we didn't predict any loss there. We have an aging uh, workforce and population, and that um, kind of secures some jobs in healthcare. Uh, <laughs> There is um, a wide range of educational needs for what we do in healthcare, but I have also counseled students on lab techs. Lab techs require a two year associate's degree, and they make fairly good money, well over the average wage. I, I can't remember the exact, I want to say 60,000, but that is a really good job coming out of school, and you don't necessarily have to handle blood to go into that healthcare industry. So, kids kind of like that. Um, but also on the um, in-demand list, every time that we change our, our projections are nurses, which you don't necessarily hear anymore, but it's still there. Registered nurses are still very high on the list of jobs in demand and uh, what people are looking for. Uh, I think with healthcare reform, that has also bumped that back up. Uh, surgeons are always on that list, but we also have... Uh, exercise therapists and respiratory therapists that make that list, all the way down to medical assistants, which don't require any additional education. So jobs all along the spectrum in healthcare and also what I would say very stable. The second uh, thing that we expect to grow the most is uh, the service industry, which is partly in, in uh, line with the population growth, but also in line with how tourism has picked up. So service industry jobs looking really good into the future. Uh, also a good place for students to start because if they need that first job, great place for them. 
<clears throat> excuse me, let's see, uh, professional services expected to do really well in the next 10 years, and that has to do with um, anyone who uh, is in a professional environment, a, a lawyer, a tax accountant, even the uh, placement agencies are in that mix. Uh, we always see placement agencies hiring before everyone else when we're going into a growth cycle, so that always is a symbol for us to know that things are going to go well. We do predict the next cycle to be at 11% growth, which is slightly lower than the last time we did it in 2012, and that's because we're kind of far along in the business cycle, right? A, a business cycle lasts anywhere from six to ten years um, since World War II we've kind of seen slowdowns hit every six to ten years and we're right at seven years since the last one hit so it's not surprising so we're just taking our uh, growth predictions down a bit not a lot 11 percent growth in ten years is still really really good it's not a decrease so we're happy but it is slightly less than we've been growing at we think and that is just because of the regular business cycle. And we will have a slowdown somewhere between now and 2024. That's just the way it works. We hope it's nothing like the Great Recession we had in 2008, but it does happen, and we do have that um, mixed in there. We don't know exactly what year, but we do have that in our formula. Um, we also expect construction. So construction, professional services, and healthcare. What, that's what the three things we expect to grow the most. Uh, construction, great. I'm so glad to see that because we have not grown as fast as everywhere else in the state in the construction field. Now, if you talk to employers, they say, I'm going gangbusters, I can't find the workers I need, but it still hasn't been at the level that Bend has seen, for example, or Portland. Now, Bend's growing for a totally different reason than we are. They're growing because people are retiring from California at a very large rate to Bend. So their industries that are growing look different than ours. Theirs are uh, tourism for the most part. We, we, we can be glad that we're diverse and things are growing for other reasons. Um, Portland, everybody knows why Portland's growing. It's Portland. <laughs> So let's see, what else do I got for you? So in terms of how many jobs that turns out to be, it's between 16 and 18,000 jobs that we expect to add in 10 years. Okay, so that, you know, that's not too crazy, but we are growing at a 2.4% rate now, and so if we did 11%, that would be a 1.1%. So we're currently beating our projections, which is great. We want to be there, but we're sort of keeping it... Uh, gentle because of the slowdown that we do expect to see. So let's hope that we continue to grow at that pace. Uh, the other thing that we talk about that's important for you to think about when you're thinking about our economy growing is, are we replacing jobs because people retired and left, or are we adding growth jobs? Are we growing? And we are doing both. We are doing both, but we really expect, which is the same as last time, to be replacing jobs more often than growing. So we expect to have those between 16 and 18,000 jobs that we add. We need to replace 37,000 jobs. So there's much more people leaving the workforce than we're growing, which is normal. We've got, everyone has heard about the baby boomers leaving the workforce. That's what's happening. So we also need to be at this place where we're talking about how can we create the pipeline, the workforce pipeline, and where can we put students in and, and where can we shift uh, people into other professions. But we think that... Uh, the two industries that will probably grow the most are healthcare and construction, and they'll still have about a 50-50 split with, with new jobs and replacement jobs. And if you talk to people in sand and gravel, they'll say their split is a lot different because they're still trying to bring in a workforce to replace people who are 70 years old. So there are some pieces of each industry that are a little outside of the average, but still growing. Where else do we think? We think every other industry, service industry, professional services, uh, nonprofits, every, every other industry we expect there to be kind of a 60 to 80% replacement need versus growth. So that's something to think about when we're talking about wood products growth. We really think there'll be some, some change over there. And we're adding some big companies, which make a big difference in our economy. Broadcom is going to come in. They were Avago. They are going to start making semiconductor chips, which is a, an industry we completely lost in the recession. So that's going to add to our uh, growing economy. We've got 
uh, Winnebago, like I said, we've got some wood products coming back, about 200 workers at Swanson coming back. This makes a difference in our economy and as our places where we can input some of our students or people looking to change careers. Let me just make sure I covered everything. I think we're getting close to being done here. Oh, the one last thing I wanted to talk about is that there is some concerted efforts in a couple industries. Uh, in the city, the county, uh, private industry, the state, we're all coming together and we're calling this work sector strategies. Your um, elected officials are involved in this. We've decided that if we're going to retain and grow business, there's a couple industries we need to help along. Healthcare is moving along at a good pace on their own. Some pieces of manufacturing are moving on a good pace of their own, but food and beverage Manufacturing had, were the only part of manufacturing that didn't lose workforce in, in the recession, and they're steadily bumping up their wages to a point where it's um, over the average wage for the county. And that's great. So we're trying to help them along, and it's definitely, you'll hear more about it. Uh, there's um, a, definitely an artesian movement of food going on. You just, I just saw in the paper, I think, this week that Yogi Tea is getting 40 more workers. You see this all the time. So there's a concerted effort going on between um, your local governments, private industry, Lane Workforce Partnership, and the Employment Department in looking at that. The, at the, the other piece of that is high tech. You might be hearing about all the uh, movement in the software industry and the high-tech manufacturing. Those are getting a second look for how important they're becoming in our, uh, in our economy here. So keep an eye out for those. Those are things that um, we're working on and that we're trying to grow and are good places to insert uh, more workforce. All right, thank you. I always have to adjust these for vertically challenged people. So good afternoon. Um, my name is Jennifer Adams. I'm the director of HR for Bulk Handling Systems. And I'm just curious, how many people have heard of Bulk Handling Systems before? So we've got a few. Good, I'm glad Kim has heard of us, that's good. <laughs> um, so Bulk Handling Systems is a manufacturer of recycling systems. So we're in that manufacturing sector that Kim spoke about. Primarily, we are a welder fabricator shop. So that means what we're doing is we are working with our customers who have obtained contracts with cities, municipalities, and they need a way to actually process the waste stream. So this can be anything from where you are putting everything into a single trash can, including your garbage and your recycling together. We put the systems that automate it so that you don't have to pull it out into separate trash cans. All the way from that, um, the bin you put your glass in here in Eugene, it can also break up that glass so that it can be used again secondarily. So with that, um, we have experienced some phenomenal growth here starting in 2016. Uh, our first big growth spurt was in 2008. So as a lot of the local areas, the, the coach manufacturers were shutting down, we were actually very fortunate that, that we were able to grab those individuals and bring them into our actual business at that time. So we had a huge growth expansion during that time period. We're going through that again now. Uh, right now, what we are seeing is two times the backlog in orders that we've seen in, in uh, company history. So it's really exciting, and at the same time, it can be very nerve-wracking, because our question to people like Kim is, where are all the people? We have the jobs, but where do we find these individuals and one of our biggest challenges is finding someone that has the skill set to work on our shop floor uh, we have found I'm new to the area I came in here I was looking for CTE programs what I called vocational at the time and I couldn't find them so what we have now is an aging workforce our average age on our shop floor is about 55 years old which means they're going to be retiring shortly and we cannot find the welder fabricators to replace them. And these are great family living wages. So what we're having to do, and we're happy to do it, we're excited to do it because it's a win-win for everyone involved, is we're able to take that individual out of a CTE high school program, bring them on 
to our shop floor and train them into these welder fabricator roles. So it's actually getting us out of our comfort zone and out of our box to say, hey, I need a fabricator with 10 or 15 years of experience and that's the only individual I'm willing to look at. Now we're saying we are going to create mentors in our shop to develop these individuals and bring them up through the workforce and teach them the BHS way of doing things. So we can't be successful without these individuals. So that is our primary recruitment effort of where our jobs are at. We're actually needing about 30 additional people in the shop. Um, case in point, we actually worked with WorkSource Oregon a couple weeks ago to get a career fair going. And through really great concerted efforts, we only had 21 people come to that career fair. So even with a database of individuals that may have this skill set, they are employed, which is fantastic for them. We're saying, yay, great for the economy. Darn, where are we gonna find these people? And the answer is we need to grow them ourselves. Um, in addition to the shop, we also have a large workforce of engineers. So this is going to be individuals that are drafting the equipment, and this is very large capital equipment, um, all the way up to creating brand new designs and ways of putting our systems in place. I can't tell you how often a customer comes to us and says, can you do this? And we say, well, we don't know, but we'll figure it out for you. And we always do. Uh, so that's about 25% of our total workforce. Our shop is about 50%. And then the remaining portion is going to be our administration portion, sales, marketing, um, accounting, those types of roles. So we're finding across the board, we have that challenge of finding individuals. But again, it's that uh, labor for our shop that is key for our business success. We can sell as many systems as we want. We can have a quadruple increase in our overall system sales. But if we don't have the individuals to build it, we're not going to be successful. So that's where we rely on individuals like Kim and WorkSource Oregon to really help us out. So that's what we do at BHS. Um, and uh, oh, there was a question. We're actually uh, one in four in the world that actually do what we do. So it's not just the US, it's the world. Um, we are actually putting a full recycling system together versus uh, an actual product. And that's what really makes us unique. Where our other competitors out there, they will sell a conveyor or what we call screening technology, and we'll actually say, we'll take the middleman out, we'll create the entire system for you, so you get much more value out of it, and you get the one point of contact for service on your systems, which is what makes us so successful and why we're so busy now. Um, the other piece of it, for the first time in company history, we're about a 50-50 split in our sales between international and domestic. So up until this point, it's been about 20, 25% have been international sales. But with the domestic market being um, somewhat softer on the commodity side, oil prices really impact the recycling world. We hope people are recycling for altruistic reasons. That's not always the case. A lot of it has to do with profits. And because those commodity prices have dropped, that's where we have shifted our focus on sales internationally. So we actually have sales happening in Russia, Australia, uh, we're targeting Brazil, uh, China should be next, so we are all over the place, in addition to the U.S. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is, well, let me get this here. I'm not the most mechanically inclined compared to everyone else at the City of Eugene. So um, my name is Becky DeWitt. I'm a human resources manager at the City of Eugene. And the City of Eugene employs over 1,400 positions. In, and, and in addition to that, we have about three to 400 temporary employees at any given time. So we do, um, we are part of that 22% of the workforce locally that is government sector. And um, there's a lot of really great work that is done to help maintain the safety and the livability of our community um, by the employees at the City of Eugene. Some of our ranges of services include everything from our public works division, which is primarily responsible for maintaining the infrastructure of the city. So everything from our roads to our wastewater systems, to our parks, um, the how those work and how those are, are safe and livable and contribute to the quality of life um, is because of the individuals within our public works department. And the skill range for those positions range everywhere from general labor positions that are um, uh, summer temporary hires um, to help maintain our roads. Um, we do do a regular 
heavy recruitment every summer to help add about 50 positions to our um, 50 to 100 positions to our regular workforce to help um, do some of those increases in the quality of our infrastructure that we can only do in the summer because we do live in Oregon and um, to everything from ongoing positions in our wastewater division, our engineering divisions, um, as well as our, as I mentioned, our parks and open space divisions. Another um, large department that we have with the city that has a huge variety of jobs is our library, recreation, and cultural services department. And the library is fairly self-explanatory. You may all know that there was a recent levy passed to help increase some additional positions in the library and also open up our branch libraries um, to restore their hours to full-time hours. And so we've recently completed a heavy level of recruitment to help restore those positions um, to really position the library to be the library of the future um, for the city and all of our citizens and community members. In addition to that, um, our recreation division has a particularly busy summer season. You'll see everything from special events such as um, movies in the park, as well as the camps that our recreation division does throughout the summer, as well as ongoing services, including adaptive recreation and community centers that really work to increase the quality of life within their um, sectors. And the job market for that is excellent for students, especially students that are high school age. Um, often, this is the first, our recreation temporary positions are the first positions that students can gain, and they can gain some excellent work experience as lifeguards or as um, recreation activity instructors to help, um, help all of our community members um, be able to participate in, um, in our community events. And then, of course, our cultural services division does bring a number of um, cultural services and um, things like the Bach Festival um, and other concerts and events to the city through both the Holt Center and the Cuthbert Amphitheater. So those jobs are fun and creative, and we have a fairly decent-sized um, marketing and booking division to help make sure that we're bringing those, um, those services into the city as well. And then, of course, we have public safety within our police department as well as our fire department. Um, our fire department is combined with the Eugene Springfield Fire Department, which covers both, um, both cities and provides services to both cities and really has a strong continuity of services between those. And of course, our police department is focused on maintaining the safety and the quality of life. And so we regularly have positions in both our police and fire divisions um, for both firefighters and paramedics as well as police officers. And our 911 call taker dispatchers service both departments and do an excellent job of providing those emergency services. And that is probably, I would say, the most challenging job that we fill within the entire city of Eugene. Um, statistics have shown that only 5% of the people in the population have the skills needed to be able to do that job, which is incredible. So we do really, really work hard to make sure that we're regularly recruiting for those positions and providing those services. Our planning and development division, you're all probably very aware of all of the work that they do. They're in the news on a regular basis, um, helping to make sure that we're um, looking at everything from an Envision Eugene, from the long term, what our city is going to look like, as well as um, helping to increase the, the livability and the businesses within downtown. So. And then our central services department provides services um, to help support the mayor and council and the work that they do, as well as the financial, human resources, and IT systems that help support everyone in the city um, so that we can be a central service to all of our departments so that they can focus on the work that they need to be doing um, to help serve our community. So as I mentioned, we do have a wide range of positions at the city that require everything from engineering degrees to um, special public safety training, such as paramedic degree, um, to very entry-level positions that don't require any experience whatsoever that are a good opportunity for individuals to gain work experience um, as well. There's also a number of administrative types of positions such as finance positions, in, um, IT positions, et cetera, that is also uh, an area that most people may not think is really attached to city government, but we really do need skilled individuals in those areas to help us um, make sure that we're continuing to provide services. 
as Kim mentioned, there is an aging workforce and the city is like any other employer is experiencing that as Jennifer mentioned as well. Um, we do have a lot of focus on make sure, making sure that we're developing a pipeline to help replace those positions um, as people do retire. And um, we're also working really hard to make sure that we're developing systems to make, make sure that they're um, leaving a lot of their good knowledge and experience behind. So we call it our workforce planning and knowledge retention initiative to, to do that. But it, what it basically means is um, make sure that we have a good pipeline of individuals who are gaining the skills and we're bringing them into the organization with professional level skills. And we're also growing individuals and providing opportunities for individuals to grow into different professions within the city. And also, in order to do that, we're also doing a lot of outreach activities um, that help expose people to different jobs that they may not either be aware of or not have enough information about to, um, to really determine whether or not it's a career path that they want to do. One example that we have of that is our um, Young Women's um, Fire Camp, and that is happening next week, actually, and I believe we're in our sixth or seventh year of that. And it's a summer camp that we invite high school age um, females to be able to participate in. And they get a lot of hands-on skills in terms of what it's like to be a firefighter. They're much braver than I am. They're rappelling down the buildings and um, putting out fires with a lot of oversight and training. And, um, um, but it's also helping those individuals gain skills to see if this is a profession that they would have an interest in in the future. We've done similar things within our um, police departments. We do have career nights for some positions when we're hiring a number of positions, such as our 911 and our police officer recruitment. So we do have career nights that are available and open to the public. So we do advertise those on a regular basis. So if you're ever interested or know anyone who might be interested in those professions, I would definitely encourage you to have them um, stop by and, and listen to the individuals that do the actual work um, and see if that's of interest to them as well. We also, um, as I mentioned, our recreation division has a really strong effort to connect with local high school age students and help them gain their experience and also a very strong effort to connect with people who are um, have retired from their careers and may want to have an interest in, in, in um, lending their skills to positions um, and to, to help serve our community as well. And we also have strong internship programs and partnerships with a number of colleges um, to help other to help individuals understand that there are opportunities for engineering and planning and other opportunities to really be in a position that would help you impact our community. So I think that's it. My name is John DeLow, I'm a City Club member, and as my question is for Jennifer, I'm curious to know more about what BHS, what kind of machinery they make, what do they recycle, um, how do they do that, and so on. Again, vertically challenged here. <laughs> all right, so um, what we are building are all forms of large pieces of capital equipment. So this will be things, one of our main products is conveyor belts. We have to move the product from one end of the plant to the other end. On top of that, we have different ways of how to separate out the materials. So that may be by size as an example. So we have a technology called a screening technology. And think of this as a large sieve for lack of a better term. And basically, we have openings within this screen where products based on their size will either drop through those holes and go to a different conveyor or be pushed up and over onto another section. So as an example, you could have a heavy drop through and you could have paper bounce up over the top. So now you've just separated two pieces out of that recycling um, waste stream. Then we also have equipment such as optical sorting units. That's our group out in Nashville but what they're doing is they're taking technology that looks at a piece of plastic as an example at a high rate of speed, determines its chemical composition, and then with a, a puff of air shoots it off in certain directions based on that composition. And then finally, we actually use weight as another methodology or wind technology to separate out the, uh, the waste stream. So that could be, as an example, in construction and demolition, you have the heavies like cement blocks drop down or gravel. Um, and then the lighter stuff like wood actually uses a wind tunnel technology and pushes it up and over. So those are the different types of equipment that we build. Do, does that material include metal? 
It so. can, absolutely. So um, aluminum cans, as an example, is a good one out there. Um, we actually use what's called an eddy current. Now, we don't build eddy currents. We actually outsource that, but it excites the metal so that when the metal is excited, it shoots off in a different direction and the plastic goes in another direction. Uh, Jerry Deedhelm, City Club member. Uh, our table was uh, talking um, about things we've heard about at LCC where they cut back one program or another. It seems to me someone said they were cutting back welding or something this last year and you were talking about welding. So we're, we're interested generally in um, what programs you might describe for us uh, that your agencies or organizations are doing to work with high school and college students to connect our Lane uh, County students with the jobs that are available. What kind of programs do you have? Okay, this is Kim Thompson from the Employment Department, and I'm so glad you asked that because I forgot to mention it when I was speaking. So uh, employers told us a few years ago that, that they thought that we should focus on um, building that workforce pipeline. So. Uh, there are 12 people who do the same thing as me in the state, and we actually go out and talk to students. So I spent last year probably in six or seven high schools and two middle schools talking to kids about what kind of jobs are out there, what they pay, what the education needed is, and whether or not they need to go to a four-year uh, college anymore to get what they need. And talking about apprenticeships is a big part of that. Uh, we have a lot of jobs like welders that go through labor unions and need to go through their apprenticeship program and I know that the labor unions go to the career fairs too um, but we you know I talk to them about that um, help them understand how to use the employment department how to use our research site there's a really good website qualityinfo.org uh, that uh, I walk them through so they can figure out not only what career path they want but what's out there there's 866 occupations officially in Oregon that you could do with all different levels of education or maybe just a high school degree or G GED and so um, for instance, Cottage Grove High School is one of the ones that's most successful. They have a career technical program that has uh, teachers that are teaching real life. And there's tons, I think more than 20 programs for career technical it used to be what you would know as vocational training, 3D printers, uh, auto shops, wood shops. Uh, Cottage Grove has a business program that does real life sports marketing and things. So there's a lot of programs out there. We just don't hear enough about them. And there's also, I know a ballot measure coming up to put more money into that program. Uh, I know the employment department does a lot. I know employers like Jennifer at Bull Candling go out and talk. Uh, last year there was a program that the Eugene Chamber did at LCC for high school kids and they came in and heard from Peterson Pacific, I think it's Peterson, they do heavy metal too, um, and they walked through the metal program at LCC, they went into the drafting program, uh, a lot of the high school principals are doing some work with that, I know the Springfield uh, mayor is very interested in making uh, maker spaces in the high schools for kids to go into these small little um, modules of a workspace that it, what it might look like and, and working with private industry to bring in equipment for kids to actually make things there. So there is a lot of work being done in the high schools and at LCC. I work with them a lot. They work with employers a lot. Uh, Lane Workforce Partnership is uh, kind of a bridge gap there. They do um, training, workforce training with employers. So there is stuff happening. It's just unfortunately not what you hear, but it is happening in Lane County. And we've, we actually were one of the pioneers of that stuff, and now it's going on more in the state. Joe Koswick, City Club member. Um, I haven't looked at the data in terms of the un people that are on unemployment. And I was wondering, how do you work with that group of people that lost their job and are collecting unemployment benefits? Uh, is there a relationship or some connection? And the other part, I guess, is the people that are on temporary assistance to needy families. They got five years to become self-sufficient. Most of them are 85% or so are single moms. And they're required to work 20 to 30 hours a week to maintain their benefit 
Yeah, I happen to know about both of those things because I, before I was an economist for the employment department, I was manager at the WorkSource Center. So um, during the recession, which was difficult, very difficult, and I had people telling me every day that they didn't know how they were going to eat. So uh, the unemployment rate, I think the highest it got in 2008 was somewhere around 11%. In a normal uh, economy, it's somewhere around 5%. Now, these are um, people who, it, it excludes discouraged workers, people who've given up, and people who are working part-time when they'd rather be working more. So leaving those two populations out, it might be higher, right? We just don't count that in the official calculation for the U U.S. But people who tell us they haven't worked in the last four weeks is how it's counted. It's counted by a survey that comes to your home. It is not counted by people who are unemployed and getting assistance, which is a misnomer, people think. Uh, it, it, it's about 20,000 people, and it, um, it hasn't gotten much better in terms of the people who are long-term unemployed, unfortunately. But the, the things that we do offer um, we have employment department staff that are in the DHS buildings working with people on cash assistance, temporary assistance to needy families, food stamps. We actually go and they're almost like an employment specialist case manager and they work super closely with DHS, uh, people who are on DHS benefits to get a little bit deeper contact on getting a job. The employment department now works a lot closer um, in a case management approach, too, with people on unemployment. So in the last four years, I'd say that's shifted to a case management approach of helping people find a job from just a, we're here to help you, come find us if you need us approach, which has, I think, really, really helped. But what the deeper problem is with that is that some kinds of jobs just don't exist anymore and it, you have to shift your skills and that doesn't just happen overnight to do something different. So yes, the rate is better. Yes, people who are long-term unemployed, uh, that rate is better, but it takes a while because that you can't just sometimes go back into the same industry you're in. You have to totally make a shift and that's difficult, especially if you've done that for 20 or 30 years and you don't have upgraded skills even in technology, which is what everyone's using these days. So there's been movement. Our unemployment rate is what they it is at a what they call a healthy rate now. Um, but yes, there will always be some level of unemployment. And at this point, it's about 20,000 people in our um, county. I'm Merlin Huff, uh, City Club member for several years. And uh, our table of questions overlaps with uh, the one um, asked previously by Jerry. But we'd be interested to know uh, from bulk handling systems and City of Eugene, uh, if uh, local high schools and LCC and others are providing the training needed for the jobs you currently have available or what you would like to see different? All right, um, so on the high school level, uh, we have finally discovered some schools in the area that do provide the CTE programs that we're looking for. Primarily for us, it's going to be the metal shop and the drafting programs out there. So one of the more successful programs that we worked with is Springfield High School. If you haven't had an opportunity to tour their CTE programs, and they do it at least twice a year it seems like, it's a phenomenal program to go see. And they have much more than the drafting and the medals, that just happens to be what BHS is looking at. Um, we've also partnered with Willamette High School and Thurston High School. And those seem to be the main high schools in this particular area in Lane County, um, Eugene Springfield, that we've so far discovered. Now if there's more out there that we're not aware of, we'd love that information so we can go partner with them also. On the LCC side of things, uh, the welding program is a very good program. What we've discovered in the past is they aren't graduating as many mm -hmm. students, so they get basically gobbled up very quickly, which is great for those students coming out of the program. Um, we're lucky if we get maybe one or two um, when they do graduate. And on the drafting side, um, it doesn't quite fit our needs for what we're looking for. And we just had a quick uh, discussion with that at our table is drafting is much different than let's draw this box and then label 
the dimensions of that box. For us, drafting means 3D modeling. So we actually have individuals that are programming a software program to model a part so that you can essentially spin it 360 degrees and see what it looks like. That's a very different skill set compared to if you've done AutoCAD in the past. And that's a skill set that needs to be um, taught at the LCC level that we haven't seen as of yet. And related to um, City of Eugene positions, we have um, partnerships with a number of local high schools as well as colleges um, in, in Oregon to um, look at opportunities for temporary employment as well as to do outreach for things um, such as the Young Women's Fire Camp that I mentioned where we do connect with those high schools and help gather interest in some of the programs that we're running. And so there um, are also different high schools that do different types of career fairs that invite departments from the city of Eugene to participate in. And we um, do actively try to take advantage of those opportunities um, to, to provide insight into the type of careers that are in government that individuals may not be, high school individuals may not even be aware of exist um, as well. There's also a large partnership with LCC paramedic program in order to, um, to become a firefighter within the city of Eugene and Springfield, candidates would need to be, have a paramedic degree as well because we provide medical services. And so that partnership with the paramedic program with LCC becomes extremely important for us. Um, and so we do an internship partnership um, to help um, students gain the skills that they need in order to get, gain that certification. Um, so that's some of those, those are just a few examples. So. Okay. I'm John Attic, City Club member since 2003. Uh, question I came up here with is, I think it's been answered by previous speakers, but uh, here's one that comes to mind. Uh, when I moved into the Bay Area and bought a house for the first time uh, in 1965, I uh, paid X amount of money for that house. And recently, uh, I learned that the, that same house, going through a couple of owners, sold for 70 times what I paid for. <laughs> 70 times. That's for real, folks. And uh, the, the question I have, uh, similar things are going on throughout the Bay Area, centering on Palo Alto, but extending uh, anyway fr uh, from Santa Rosa down to San Jose. And uh, we see uh, and people commuting from San Francisco to Palo Alto to work rather than the other way around. Uh, what does that mean for the economy of Eugene and Lane County? Well, it means places like Bend are getting overrun with Californians. <laughs> But for you, gee, and that's true. I mean, their economy is growing the fastest, and that's one of the biggest reasons. But it, it does have an effect everywhere else in the state, too, right? So you're not just going to move to Bend. You might like trails and running, and you might want to move to Eugene. So it does affect our economy. In fact, when I go talk at U of O, I ask the kids how many of them are from California, and it's about 70% of the class or more. So it's affecting the influx of our workforce, right, as well. It, in my mind, that's the biggest, uh, because we really want kids coming out of colleges to stay here, right? So we, we're, we're, that's part of our workforce need. We have to get them from every avenue we can. So I think it's going to have an effect on home buying. It's going to have an effect on the um, skill level, the amount of people that are here. So you want that. You need some in-migration. And you just hope that it's more diverse than what's happening in Bend, where it's mostly retired folks, so they're not getting the workforce they need. Lucky for us, we have a four-year uh, college here, so we can get in the millennials the, the, you know, the start of the workforce. So I think it's a good thing for the most part. But there are obviously some other things. But I'm just going to stick to workforce, because that's what I know. Uh, Ruth Demler. And I appear to be the only woman who has a question here, but uh, it's good to see all of you speakers are women. Um, but I, the question hasn't really related as much sometimes to women in employment. And I was wondering, uh, what is the growing um, approach and the growing uh, help for women here in our Lane County for employment? I don't see some, the opportunities that you've mentioned been really opportunities such as welding and everything. I don't see women going in for that. 
And, and I was just wondering, besides the health, what are some of the other fields that you find good opportunities? And have salaries been comparable now with men? So the city of Eugene has a number of positions that um, include positions that we consider women in non-traditional fields, um, um, types of positions. And so um, I do believe the local high schools have active efforts to do outreach both with the city as well as a number of employers, um, such as manufacturing employers as well, to help expose um, high school aged females to the types of positions that are possibly non-traditional, such as engineering, construction, manufacturing, um, public safety, such as police and fire. Um, those are the types of speakers that, I, that those local high schools do bring in on a regular basis for their female students just to expose them um, to those professions. I can definitely tell you, um, we are actively encouraging high school and college level and colleges that we work with especially to ensure that they're getting females into their programs to gain the training that they need such as for example we partner with oregon state university um, it's called a ccup program which is their civil engineering program and um, we encourage them to actively recruit females to become civil engineers um, so that we can help bring them into our workforce as well so there are efforts that are going on, but there's always room for additional efforts um, to make sure that we're um, giving everybody equal opportunity for some great living wage and above positions. So. This is Kim Thompson from the Employment Department. One more thing on that. I have actively heard from employers in construction, manufacturing, and software, especially, that if they could get more women, they would be a priority because that is a priority to them. And I know there's a lot of STEM training going on in the schools, science, technology, engineering, and math. And there's a lot of focus towards women and, and, and high school girls in that. Lane ESD has a few career fairs that are just for women. And they are the educational umbrella in Lane County. So I think if you wanted to consider a non-traditional uh, occupation right now is the time as a woman. Julie Boy here, beyond, uh, city club member for about a year. My question is for Kim. You mentioned that the rising jobs are in healthcare and construction, correct? Mm -hmm. I didn't hear any mention of a growing economy, especially in the wake of climate change, um, as we begin to wean off of more polluting industries, that things like solar, wind, um, economies, that, the emerging economies, right, that are going to basically make us think more critically about how we're going to continue to live on this planet. So I just wanted to hear from you um, if workforce has looked into economies that are beginning to emerge and ones that are not yet created that need um, intelligent minds that are leaving Eugene for other places like San Francisco, Denver, New York, LA. Um, what plans are there to retain these folks and um, look forward to an economy that isn't so dependent on industry and more so on innovation. That's a good question. Um, I, we tried a few years ago to study a green economy and to lump jobs into green sectors, and it, we realized really quickly that it exists in every industry, so it's so hard to put your finger on it because a triple tractor trailer that runs on biofuel can be considered a green industry. and. That's debatable. So we kind of left that effort and just decided to um, look at, at jobs like wind turbine technology on its own. And yes, some of those are growing, but then they also get caught up in government subsidies and um, you know, it, it gets expensive at times and not expensive at times. So it ebbs and flows. So it's difficult to say that for sure, but there are people working on those uh, industries and uh, what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry, I forgot that part. Emerging jobs, right? Yeah, emerging, I mean, just transit, for example, just transitions around, you know, from certain economies are beginning to tank and then yeah. transitioning into something like, there's a new solar bill that just came out that is gonna require tons of jobs. Yeah, the only thing I can say about that is sometimes things catch up with emerging jobs later than, so what we, what we count on is community colleges, honestly, to 
because they can respond faster, right? And in programs like RAIN, the regional accelerator, putting out entrepreneurs. So we, we have a regional accelerator here that's run through the U of O and um, they and Ferdy Labs. They, if you don't know what that is, look it up. It's a great entrepreneur startup. They really work with the university and try to get those entrepreneurs out of the research setting and into a business and keep them here, right? Instead of letting them go to the Silicon Valleys and the Seattles, keep them here, grow their businesses here, hopefully sell their businesses here and start another. So that I think is the biggest resource we have is the regional accelerator. Um, it's located at U of O and OSU, but I also think there's just individual companies that, that um, things like chambers of commerce and private industries like the Technology Association are really trying to market and get their information out more so we can support emerging technology because things do change quickly. Thank you for coming today. I'm Paul Thompson, no relation, <laughs> City Club member for a number of years. Um, during your, uh, your presentation, Kim, we didn't hear any specific reference to the agricultural industry uh, to include cannabis and also to Silicon Shire. That's a name that's been stamped on this area and yet you didn't mention it at all in terms of software people uh, inventing gaming, uh, cell phone apps, et cetera. What can you tell us about those two things? So thank you for bringing that up because that's also something I forgot to go into detail about. Uh, so Silicon Shire is a, basically a website home where lots of software people can get their information in one place so that you can know where the software jobs are, know who the companies are, uh, gaming included. Uh, it has been taken over by um, Ferdy Labs and Rain, in terms of the regional accelerator that I mentioned a minute ago, in terms of entrepreneurship and startups, and the Technology Association of Oregon has come in with Matt Sayre, and he's organizing, helping to organize that. So it's, it's on its second leg. I'd say it's still around. It's still, you could still siliconshire.org find it. Uh, I think Concentric Sky started it. It's still popular, and it is one of those sector strategies that I was talking about. They are involved in the group. The community is coming together to support those employers, grow the employment. We have probably 500 companies that do either computer system design or gaming software or Symantec. I mean, we have a very large sector. It's just that it, it kind of ebbs and flows with projects with, I'm sure you've seen Veritas was sold from Symantec, dropping our employment a little bit in that area. But it is one of those sector strategies that our community is supporting and growing. Um, there are some new people in the game, like the Regional Accelerator that, that and Ferdy Labs that are supporting that. But it is a very viable sector that we're growing, and there are a lot of people working on. And that, that was all your question. Agriculture. Oh, agriculture. Yes, agriculture. Uh, I didn't mention it because it's not one of the fastest growing, but it is growing. Every sector is going to grow into the next 10 years, except for maybe, uh, I'm sorry if you're a newspaper person, newspaper publishing, book publishing, that's about the only one that we have predicted to at a loss for the next 10 years. And I'm sure we can all guess why that is. A lot of internet news, Twitter, Facebook, stuff that are is making it more difficult to compete. But yes, agriculture will grow, not at a huge rate. Um, we don't have cannabis in agriculture. Mostly it's in manufacturing. Um, some of the jobs that we have that we watch are in manufacturing. And as soon as I get a baseline for that, then I'm going to start going around and talking about that. Don't have enough data yet to know. But obviously it grows. See, it's one of those mostly retail places that are going to crop up a lot and then we feel that maybe the strongest will survive and it will even out and then we'll be able to talk more about it. So we're just starting to track that. We just figured out how to even put them in an official category. So we will be talking about that in the near future, but I don't have any data yet on it. All right. Thank you. Today's program is titled Where the Jobs Are. Thank you to our speakers, Kim Thompson, Jennifer Adams, and Becky DeWitt for bringing clarity and vision to this topic.